So how do you uh, have an intro in uh, Ayama? Do you do any like one, two, three clap or you don't do that? In, in, no. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> just in Hollywood. <laughs> I don't, I just kind of go into it. So okay, let's um, go into it. No stretching and be pain free, says Yogi Aaron, Canadian living in Costa Rica in Blue Osa Retreat Spa, Yoga Retreat Spa, where he's working on his Ayama Applied Yoga Anatomy plus Muscle Activation Method. He's doing a lot of books. He's doing a lot of videos. Let's hear his story and how you can be pain-free. And remember, no stretching. Let's so hello, it. Aaron, for joining to the podcast of Being the Genuine Athlete. It surrounds everything because I think that an athlete is a person. We are all athletes in some way. So thank yes. you for joining us. Thank you so much. And Appreciate I'm it. in Dominican Republic and you're in Costa Rica. Costa Rica, yes. Costa Rica. That's a rich coast. Rich, 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 rich coast. Abundant. Yeah, Costa Rica has those rich coasts. It's beautiful, beautiful. Abundant beautiful. in nature. Yes. And everything. Yes. And abundant in a lot of retreats and resorts also yoga in this style right yeah i mean costa rica is kind of like the bali of latin america that a lot of people come here to explore yoga there's a ton of yoga retreats um and uh but we're one of the only ones in the south part of costa rica a lot of them are more in the fancier parts of costa rica um okay. And uh, where they're up in Guanacaste. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, the gringo style. Okay. Yeah, the gringo style. <laughs> cool. So, but yeah, no, we're in the south part and it's just a blessing to be here um, where I'm located in my yoga retreat center. It's Blue, Blue Osa. Blue Osa. O S A. O S A. Yeah. Okay. And in the, in the Osa Peninsula, uh, National Geographic said in, uh, made a statement, it said that 2.5% of all the Earth's biodiversity exists in this one little small area. Um, so it's just an amazing place to be. I mean, and it, something else, they have an Aaron there. They have a what? Sorry. An Aaron. Aaron. Aaron, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I am the only Aaron. <laughs> yeah, additional to 2.5 biodiversity, they have a yoga yogi Aaron with his Ayama yes. approach to life. <laughs> cool. Um, please guide us just a bit so that uh, the listeners, viewers can get in tune with your story, your hero's journey. I wrote down from anguish, pain to freedom. Because you've been in pain all the time, man. What was going on with you? Yeah, I, I'm, um, I started yoga when I was about 18. And I remember the first time I threw my back out. And being 18, and, and you mentioned earlier, like, we're all athletes inside. I, I've always considered myself somewhat of an athlete, like someone who aspires to use this body, like the most that I can hiking, um, snowshoeing, dog sledding, canoeing, um, you hockey. name it. Uh, hockey, actually I Canadian. played ice hockey too. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. for sure. Um, and so all of those things are really important to me, especially like at that time in my life, I was really into long distance running as well and working out. And like I said, hiking is my, hiking is my big jam. I love hiking and, 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 trail i think they call them trail finders or trail running you know that sort of thing and i remember the first time my back went out and it was your back it, went where to grenland went out like it just it seized up my lower to grenland back or up. <laughs> it went out of where <laughs> it's an english expression it's okay. kind of a weird expression yeah. but so you got injured my lower, my lower back seized up and um and then so before that, I had started doing stretching and yoga, making that part of my routine. And like a lot of people, you know, in the sort of fitness world that they do, yo they go to their gym to work out and get weights and they go to yoga to stretch and they join a running club to for cardio. But I, yeah. And so I kind of had like yoga as my kind of stretching uh, practice. 
Well, one of the things that the yoga teacher said to me and, and numerous times uh, since then is like, oh, you just need to stretch more. You need to be more flexible. And so that's what I did. I started to stretch a little bit more. I started to um, try and deepen my yoga practice and make my body more into a pretzel. <laughs> and twist your ankle here. Oh my God, I could do it all. I mean, the things I could do back then. And, you know, and I was young enough that my body would recuperate pretty quickly. Um, but as I started to get older and as I got into my late 20s and early 30s, I started not just developing pain, but like searing neuro, neuro, neuro pain, like nerve pain. And I never put it together like, hmm, maybe the yoga is causing some of this stuff. Um, because in my mind, I just believe like I just needed to stretch more. I needed to um, open up more. And it wasn't until I was around 45. I mean, there was a few light bulb moments along the way, but the biggest one, one of the biggest ones was when I was 45 and I ended up in the surgeon's office and he's telling me like, you are probably going to need to have a spinal fusion. And I was like, there has got to be another way. Like I'm 45 years old. I'm too young to be getting <laughs> spinal fusion. <laughs> and so shortly after that, I was visiting uh, my friend, Eric, uh, who does muscle activation technique. And it's a, te it's a systemology that's been developed by Greg Roscoff um, to do a few things, but they, one of the things is to identify where there's muscle weakness and then he's developed a technique to activate muscles that have gone inactive. And this kind of systemology works at a neuromuscular level. And so when I was visiting Eric, one of the things that he did was a very kind of passive stretch on me, like very, very, very passive. And before he did that stretch, he basically had that group of muscles strong. And it was my hip flexors at that time, you know, which is the psoas, the iliacus, rectus femoris, et cetera. The so famous ones of the sciatica and everything else. The, the famous ones. And so he got all those muscles strong. And then he did this passive stretch. And it wasn't anything too dramatic. It wasn't anything like, you know, trying to bring my foot behind my head. It was very passive. It was very gentle. Um, and... And then afterwards he tested the muscle and it was weak. And I was completely blown away because this was something that we do in yoga a lot. And I thought to myself, if this is happening to me, what have I been doing You know, all these years? And then what have I been doing to my students? And do I wanna keep doing this to my students? I, I stopped, I vowed to never teach stretching again after that time and um and so that's kind of the short story in a nutshell <laughs> yeah your hero's journey from being strong invincible young person and then hitting the more than rock bottom in your yeah. spinal fluid and fusion and everything else that was going on <laughs> and your neck was in pain and your scapula and you had different Things, yeah, right? all along that journey, when I was in my early 30s, I developed this searing neck pain, you know, like right in here. And then like it a was nail shoot. inside or something. Yeah, I mean, I didn't use the word nail, but I used the word knife. Same thing. It was like, I'm, I'm I, mean, thinking I remember a big nail. <laughs> <laughs> a big knife, nail, yeah. But it's pain. It's pain. And I would seriously not be able to sleep a lot at nights. And, you know, and then of course I would try and stretch it out, which actually made it worse in the long run and wasn't helping it. It wasn't until actually I went to see Eric. This was much before it was the first time I met Eric and he worked on me. And when I went to see him, the pain was like nine out of 10. Um, and after he worked on me, he actually got the pain down to like one out of 10. And I was like, I mean, I've had people work on me a lot. I've never experienced that before. And what he was doing was he was going in and activating all the muscles that support the vertebrae of my neck. And what was happening before was because the muscles weren't working properly, 
my neck was compressing, my bones literally were compressing in on a nerve. And, and that was what was causing the nerve pain. So as soon as we got the muscles working properly, the neck had support that was the muscles were supporting the vertebrae of the neck. And a lot of people don't like, in, you know, both of us have a background in fitness. Both of us have a background in, in um, that kind of world in, in movement. And one of the things that fascinates me, there's a few things that fascinate me, but one of them is that we forget that a muscle's job is to move bones and to stabilize joints. And if the muscle isn't working, then there's no stability. There's no stability in the joints. And it's just, it's mind blowing to me that that's a not, that I didn't realize that. It took like that, all of that to happen for me to realize what is muscles function? What is a muscles function? Um, and then of course that the experts are not teaching that. Like that just blows my mind. <laughs> like something that's so obvious is not like being taught. Yeah, because we live in a obvious, uh, self-granted, mythical world, illusional world that, of yeah. course, supports our our not feeling the amnesia, the disconnection between the body, mind, emotions, and everything. I went through almost a similar uh, thing like you did, not as hard, but I had some. I fell on my hip, right hip, several times as mm -hmm. a kid, teenager. You know, mm -hmm. slipped and also ice skating thing, and you slam on it then i did the manual therapy that manually relaxes the muscles and moves the bones back to the place so that my pelvis was aligned uh but i always did like after my table tennis practice that we had the sessions after as a professional athlete coach always said do the stretching and i was the only one like out of 20 maybe two or me myself was doing the stretching everybody was like, like okay stretching nobody wanted to do stretching <laughs> and i was like serious in everything you know and i also i know that my hips and my mobility and function were like very limited also from the falling on them and i you know like a man we are more limited in that way region and i always wanted to stretch them but i knew that hmm Either I break something or I just don't do it. So I stay with where they are. So I did that approach more soft, but still stretching. And I needed to feel that stretch, that pain. And it's so obvious for us that that is normal. But that is not normal. Yeah. We're not talking about the new normal or anything like that. We're not in politics, <laughs> but, you know, but like this is not okay. Pushing yeah. the limits that your body is screaming at you from different parts. Hey, stop. I'm in pain. And we're like, no, just go. Yeah. Just do it. We need to do it. The coach said you need results. You need to move. You need to hike. You need to this. Need, need, need. It's so um, overwhelming. And then, of course, um, you know, the battles are won by the mind, but the war is won by the body. This is mm -hmm. the reality. And then at the end, you meet a surgeon that tells you the harsh reality that's over and out of the space for your obviousness. And yeah. then you are stuck with struck and by that lightning and by that reality that you need to come out of and come to terms with. And a lot of people are like you said, they are, we are young. We all were young and we are invincible. We don't have the old wisdom. We don't listen to the old people, especially when you're a teenager. Uh, <laughs> And then when you're in your 20s, you're like, hmm, maybe I should listen, but not yet. And you'll never have pain. All these people are geriatric. They, I'm not like them. But then you come to terms of the reality and you see that it's not like that, that it's not about hurting yourself and regenerating because you always pay the price. We have so many units of, you know, some mobility, some functionality available, some life available, uh, like this to our disposal. But if we misuse them and abuse ourselves, we come to a very geriatric state of being. Like with my hip, that it's very, very limited movement. Mm -hmm. And before I did the right thing, thankfully I did the AEQ by Alesh Ayers, that, that's the innovator. I was doing the, not the soft MAT like you did. I was doing to my mass masseuse therapist, yeah, just, you know, push it. It will it will move. It will get better by going over. It's not like that. No. Please, let's go into the why not stretching. Stop stretching is your podcast as well, your book. 
what's <laughs> with this stretching that's so not good? That's obvious that it's not good. So I, mean, I think, first of all, why, why do muscles stop working or why do muscles, why is there a problem in the mus muscular system? And so from an MAT standpoint, from what I've learned from MAT um, in my, my background there is it's got to do, we're working more in the neuromuscular system. So there's the messaging system between the brain and the muscle isn't working. Um, for example, like if, as I'm sitting here, if I decide to lift my right knee uh, towards my chest, the brain has to send a muscle or a message to like the hip flexors, like contract, contract, contract. So eventually those messages get there. But from our standpoint, we define um, proper muscular contraction or a healthy muscular contraction when a muscle can contract and contract on demand. I mean, there is like one time when I was um, showering, this is going back many years now. Um, and I was at the end of a teacher training, I was leading a teacher training. It was a really stressful kind of month for me for a lot of various reasons. And I was leaving for vacation, like right after the teacher training. So I had a lot on my mind. There was a lot of stress. The day before the end of the teacher training, I had demonstrated this yoga pose. It was a balancing pose and I was twisting my body and, you know, putting stress on it. And the next day I was in my shower and I was washing my hair and I reached up and grabbed like the shampoo bottle. And at that moment, my back, my upper back uh, seized up. And I was going to say it went out, but <laughs> in my mind, Alaska <laughs> seized up. And I developed like this searing pain right in between my shoulder blades. Um, and so, you know, the, I was reaching up for the shampoo bottle and I lifted my arm, but my muscular system couldn't support my arm lifting. And that's why the pain ensued. So those muscles that supported the lifting of the arm and grabbing that very heavy bottle of shampoo, <laughs> um, they couldn't, so they couldn't support that stress um, at that moment of me just lifting my arm. And so there was a disconnect between the brain and the muscles. It's kind of like one way to think about it is like a phone line between the brain and the muscles. And so what we're trying to do is to improve that connection. What we find or what we have found, um, not we, but like the science community, because there's a lot of evidence um, to start supporting this. But what we find is that when we start to stretch, we start to push the muscle beyond its capacity of what it can do. So a simple example of that is like, if you lie on your back and you bring your knees to your chest and your arms are out to the side, with normal people, there's like a distance between the knees and the chest, okay? But if we can always grab the knees and bring the knees to our chest, but the muscles aren't contracting that way. The muscles can only bring the knees that far. They can't bring the knees that far. So when my knees are to my chest, my brain is connected to the muscles. The muscle spindles are saying, we can only contract this far. The brain is saying, okay, you can only go this far. Now we can improve it maybe by letting the legs come out, bring them back, bring them out, bring them back and, and do some repetitions. We can probably improve that contractibility. But if I bring my hands around the knees and pull the knees towards my chest, I'm now forcing all of those muscles to contract beyond what they're capable of contracting. And then literally the brain loses connection with those muscles. Um, the brain doesn't know where those muscles are in space. And so there's no accountability in the body when we start to force a range of motion that's not natural. I mean, that's it kind of like in a nutshell. Another way of saying it is like, you know, there's a sense of proprioception. Like my brain knows where those muscles are, um, especially as it's doing like a movement. But as soon as I passively move the body a certain way, the brain disconnects uh, from those muscles. And once it disconnects from those muscles, there is now weakness there because the muscles no longer can contract and contract on demand yeah 
and then we have the interoception all the sensors yeah. from the inside of the body that are being sent uh, yeah. with the aq method i've i've learned and heard and practiced and experienced by myself and with the clients that i work with that we should have a 20 to 80 ratio 20 is the brain sending the signals 80 is the body sending back to the brain so that yeah. the brain can decode decipher distinguish filter and do what it needs to do yeah. but we live in a world where it's 99 brain we live in a very brainish world and one percent body yeah i've had athletes that said to me literally wrote to me every day you're a I don't care what will happen. I need to win. I need to achieve. I need to get. I'm like, you are going to hurt your body. It doesn't matter. I'm willing to pay the price. So <laughs> we are so much, especially in the athlete world, so much in our brain, and especially in the USA college university sport, just go, just do over, over the limit. And of course, stretching included doing over so we are not only like you mentioned this gap that happens when we stretch and push something out of the boundaries that the brain can decipher we enter into that gap into that breach and that yes. is where the, a lot of disease and and, and, and injuries happen yeah. that is where we are being we are striking the iron gold for the negative side yes that is where we completely abuse ourselves and and in that way, the proprioception, interoception is so important that we begin to give uh, with the brain, allowing that these uh, signals are being uh, understood, accepted, and deciphered. Now, yeah. why does this happen? And you can then connect with your Ayama approach. The what's Ayama stands for? Uh, applied yoga anatomy and muscle activation. Yes, applied <laughs> yoga anatomy and plus muscle activation. Yes. So as I've learned through this method, the AEQ, the Aequitas, is that as a child, we are being, you know, raised up by parents yeah. and by the environment. We are very, you know, uh, innocent and very uh, vulnerable until the age of three, until that age, a baby, a kid should be with his mom uh, or her mom. And then afterwards, we go to sort of school and this thing, but everything is changed. Moms need to go to job three months postpartum and whatever. So all these kids, especially uh, also us, everybody is affected by this pressure from the outside. You as a kid are very egoistically um, uh, directed because you want to be safe. You want to be protected. Of course, you're going to do everything so that your parents stay together so that they don't fight. And maybe even they don't fight, but you interpret some harsh words like is that they will separate. And of course, you begin to behave good or you begin to behave like a renegade sometimes because you don't want them to have more problems as they already do. So you take on the responsibility that they should have but your body, your muscles, your system is not built to take on that pressure. No. So you begin to push some muscles into some positions that they are not supposed to be. Some muscle groups tend to have more um, weight and pressure on. So moving your head can be like that, moving it back like that. But you can move also with your with your whole body. You don't need to just yes. move the, the, the neck muscles. But because we use the smaller groups, which are not supposed to do some movements, we began to be stiff and we create this sensor motor amnesia, the body mind disconnection, nervous disconnection, like you mentioned priorly. Yep. And this is how we begin to live. Either it's forward, either it's backward, either it's sideways, wow. depending on the trauma. You and this is how, <laughs> how we develop this tension that is there present in a muscle subconsciously through our whole life. And then yeah. some people develop this uh, or that injury. Like, for instance, one example, I just talked to my mom this week. She sent me an MRA, MRA that she did. She has pain in her neck for several months. She, you know, accepts what she accepts. She's where she is in her world of consciousness. And she's like, uh, I have so much pain. I cannot sleep. I just take the pill. I'm still in suffering. And I'm like, you need to relax and I can guide you at least to some point that you will relax. This has nothing to do with my injury. I'm not tense. What are you talking about relaxation? 
because she was a sewer, you know, she was sewing dresses and she was always like that, sewing yeah. in her machine for 30, 40 years of life. And now she has her life story, what she has, and everything is here, like sucking out the energy. The muscles are tense when uh, when they are not supposed to be, when they should be relaxed. And mm -hmm. I tell her, because you are tense, you are push, putting the pressure on the bones, so they get abused. The, the cartilage and the discs and the hernia and everything happens. That has nothing to do with it. I'm going to go to that therapy. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. So I'm putting my mom a bit down, but that's how many people are responding. Yeah. So please guide us a bit to all that I mentioned now. How do you bring people with Ayama, the Applied Yoga Anatomy, plus muscle activation? How do you guide people out of this vicious cycle of denial, suppressing, diminishing, you know, uh, being in that state of not understanding the agonist antagonist relationship of the muscles. If I move here, I need to relax this. Yeah. If I move here, I need to relax this. So it's all connected. How does Ayama work with this? <laughs> well, it's a process. Um, I, one thing you said, which I wanted to respond to was, I think you said something really important that a lot of people like have pain in their shoulders, for example. And so they go to a physiotherapist and the physiotherapist says, yeah, it's because your rotator cuff muscle isn't working, the supraspinatus or teres minor or something like that. And so then what the physiotherapist does is just give them exercises to strengthen the teres minor and supraspinatus, but they never really address like the major muscles. And that just blows my mind. Like, you know, like what about getting the, the actual muscles that support the shoulder joint, like the major muscles, like working properly. And so just as you were saying that so many of these like little muscles are getting abused and overused um, because these major muscle groups are not working because there's no connection between brain and because the muscle. No matter what, we need to do the yeah. movement. We need to achieve yeah. no matter what. We are not understanding the all what it takes to do a certain movement, all of the groups. It was really interesting. My my teacher in MAT, Greg Roskopf, was telling the story one time about how he was working with a pro golfer. And this pro golfer had developed a frozen shoulder. Now, for people watching this that don't know, frozen shoulders is basically like when the shoulder just becomes locked and you have no range of motion. And typically with therapy takes a year and a half uh, to fix with using muscle activation technique, we decrease that time um, very considerably. And so what Greg did was worked on this guy. And um, so you think about like golfing, you, you have to twist and lift the arm up. Well, what Greg started doing was actually working. He didn't even touch the shoulders. All he did was got the, the rotator muscles in the core working and the first rotator muscle is the transverse abdominis and then oblique. So if those guys aren't working, you can think about like if you're twisting and these muscles aren't supporting the torso, what is supporting the torso? The shoulder. So I find that really fascinating. I think that you touch on like such an important point um, about that. But in terms of like reaching people, there's a couple of ways that I reach people, but what I've come to realize is that there's three kinds of people. Um, there's the kind of people that I tell this to like, stop stretching, you know, let's start activating. And they get really angry with me um, because it threatens their sort of worldview um, that, that they ask the question, like, especially with yoga teachers, like you have to stop stretching. Well, then if I'm not teaching stretching, what am I teaching? You know, in my yoga classes, I actually had like a very senior teacher say that to me just recently, like such a good friend of mine. And I've helped her with a yama. And she turned to me and she said, but we're teaching yoga. And I said, yeah, we're teaching yoga. What's your point? Well, we're teaching stretching. And so it really threatens people's sense of self. The second kind of person is the kind of person that thinks like I'm their crazy grandmother and it's like, oh, that's really cute, you know, and you just keep talking like that. Here's a shawl to keep you warm. Um, and then the third kind of person, I think, is people like you who um, maybe 
not with your knowledge that you have right now, but people that have injured themselves or kind of sense like, oh, you know, it's not really good to stretch or I really hurt myself when I stretch. And so they're more receptive to it. But I always find that when people take my classes or even do like a 15 minute practice with me, 15 minutes, that they leave feeling stronger and more stable and something that a lot of people are obsessed with is range of motion. You know, like I want to become, I want to have more range of motion, but when our muscles work properly, we get more range of motion and we have stability in that range of motion. Um, and there's a very famous uh, ballerina or ballerina dance teacher, uh, instructor of the Australian ballet company, her name just escaped me now, um, but she refuses to teach or to have her, her dancers use the word stretching and flexibility. She said, I don't want them to stretch because when they stretch, when they bring their leg up here, they can't keep their leg there without the hand holding the leg there um, because there's no, there's no strength in that range of motion. And so when I'm working with people and I get them to actually start to do these things, they go, wow, I'm not in pain. Like, how did that happen? And, um, and then they, that it starts to become more real for them. So I think that one of the, to answer your question is just, we got to give people an experience as much as possible. If people are open to it, if they have a direct experience, they feel it in their body very quickly. And they notice two things. They notice how much stronger they are. And then they notice that they're not um, experiencing pain like they did before. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, I had pain in my right hip and priorly in my right, uh, I injured also my right uh, knee meniscus uh, disc. Mm -hmm. I injured my right ankle, always on the right side, sort of. I had some minor accidents and injuries on my left side, but mostly on the right side. I'm also yeah. a righty, but it doesn't matter. And what I've come to terms with, with the AQ method is that there's always a reason. There's always a root cause. Like you already mentioned, a lot of uh, phys physicians, a lot of doctors, a lot of physiotherapists, they always do the, the symptom, cure the symptom, but it's the root cause. So yeah. in my case, my root cause, like I mentioned in some of the previous podcasts, uh, was and is somehow still the, the my relationship with my dad. The right side is like male side, dad side, and the hip, because I carried the weight that my dad should be carrying. And also I used my hamstring and my exterior muscle in my in my femoris uh, in my thigh i used it too much when actually my body should be carrying that weight so yeah. everything was stiff and my my hip was hitting in the hip cuff cup and it was using abusing the cartilage because it was too tight and when i began to do the exercises i sent the signal the movement was there but i didn't get it back because it was already so abused and misused how I was living my life. And I was studying sport and I was studying uh, as a professional athlete and, and all the, the stretching and all this agenda and myths and actually uh, very much obvious things, but from which world and what is the price that we all were paying and people are still paying very much. And then we have, like, I imagine sometimes that with this, that I'm dealing, that I'm doing now, studying now, analyzing now and teaching now with the AQ and you with the Ayama, and the MAT is so many, uh, you know, MAT, AEQ, Ayama, so many <laughs> like, like letters, initials. Ayama. <laughs> what crazy. else? SEQ, SMA, la la la. So, in that way, uh, now, I've, now I forget what I wanted to tell. Um, um, what, what, where did it go regarding the. Yeah, it will get back. You started to build the messaging between the brain and the muscle, and you started to get more proprioception and more stability. Yes. So in that case, when you begin to realize how limited we live, when you begin to see how shallow, actually, we are not even profound, not even the width, not even the depth. We don't yeah. have that profoundness that is necessary in order to live not only 
successfully in the external world but the interior world to understand yeah. this it's all interconnected it's not just spirituality it's not just yoga it's a lot of things because if you're a good yogi but you need a, a spinal infusion fusion uh, surgery you're not a good yogi you're doing something wrong yeah. you're abusing yourself so with chronic pain i see it not only on a physical level chronic pain comes from emotional abuse and also a mental abuse of oneself not yeah. only from others of oneself because as many athletes we are abusing ourselves yeah professional athletes are self-abusing all the time and that is why they suffer and especially because they want results and especially if they don't reach them and majority of athletes do not reach results because the first spot is usually reserved for the some few of them yeah so in that sense the all this pain, and you mentioned a lot about pain-free uh, uh, method and, and the result after Ayama is pain-free. As I see it, we need to hear and listen and sense the pain and listen to the pain and understand it. And then yeah. we can move on to other levels of different kind of pain and that it's lower if it needs to be or it's gone because we are not anymore doing out of our range of motion certain movements or not abusing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on the pain-free aspect? Yeah, sure. I, 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 if you said something really important is that we need to pay attention to the pain because the pain is like the check engine light, you know. I remember one time I was in a car or a taxi and the guy's check engine light was on and I was like, do you know your check engine light's on? He goes, ah, I'm not worried about it. And I was like, oh Lord, I hope I get to the airport all right. <laughs> that, that the check end, pain is the check engine light and pain is usually a symptom of inflammation. Inflammation, from our perspective is usually due to muscles not working. And so there's stress, trauma, or overuse in that joint. In your case, it was the hip joint. Mine, it was well everywhere in my body. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's important that we start to pay attention to the pain and what I try to teach people, this is part of the applied yoga um, anatomy part is like to teach people experiential anatomy, like be inquisitive about well, what muscle is there. And if we can start to understand that, like, like one day I went for a walk, one of my kind of ways that I exercise now um, is by walking. It's, it's a nice, gentle, easy movement that um, is, has low impact, but a lot of benefits. And um, so I've been walking a lot and one day I went out and I was going for my walk and I had this pain in my groin. Um, and I was like, what's going on there? And so I kind of like stopped for a moment and I was kind of like analyzing it. Well, if, if it, my adductor groins, groins are the adductors, what is the opposite? The abductors. So I actually stopped there for a moment and I activated the opposite muscle which was the gluteus medius. And I just kind of did it really quick. I did it for the, the methodology for uh, muscle activation is to hold it in isometric contraction gently for six seconds and do it six times. I did it. The pain was gone like that. It actually blew me away. I mean, I experience this stuff all the time, but when it, when the response is that quick, so I didn't stretch it out. So a normal yogi, a yoga person would go, oh, there's a pain in my groin and um, I need to stretch that out to feel better and to help my groin. But that's actually the absolute wrong thing to do. I think that one of the most fascinating things, this is another thing that kind of perplexes me, is that never before in my yoga life have I ever heard anybody talk about why muscles are tight to begin with. I mean, people are so obsessed with their hamstrings and just different areas, but we don't really ask why are muscles tight? And, and the reason why muscles are tight is because there's instability in the body. As soon as the body senses instability, it sends a message like tighten up, tighten up, tighten up. And so for whatever reason, there was instability in my groin and in my hips um, a muscle wasn't doing this job and my body was just saying, hey, tighten up to create more uh, stability. It's kind of like if you walk on ice, you know, you step out on some ice, 
what do you do? You you tighten up. If you're in a scary movie, which I hate going to scary movies because of my bodily reaction is always like, oh, and I tighten up. And so it's a, it's a natural physiological response in the body when it senses danger, when it senses instability, it tightens up. So what we want to do is ask the question, well, what muscles are not doing their job? Let's start getting those muscles to work properly. And as soon as they do, the pain disappears because the body no longer senses instability. And interestingly, pain is always the result of inflammation. The inflammation disappears like that. Like I've seen it disappear like on a dime. Um, and that's, so that's, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. This is the same thing that different methods are coming to terms with and yeah. life actually, because yeah. we live in a world where we want to achieve, uh, conceive, get, uh, go there, you know, diminish something and, you know, prove something to someone. And we yeah. live in a world, of course, especially coming from our childhood, we always want to prove ourselves to us or to our parents or to the community and there's always the contraction. And especially yeah. going through life as a young child, you always have some situations that are traumatic for you. Maybe it's traumatic that your mom doesn't give you, you know, food on the table. You live in yeah. abundance, but no food one day and you're traumatic. Or now it's more traumatic because your mom takes away the iPad or some things. <laughs> Five minutes. That's a big trauma. So you immediately compress and contract. And there's so much, we live in a world that's only about contract, contract, contract. But then there's the other side, like you mentioned, some side is contracting, the other side is relaxing. It needs to prolongate, not stretch. Prolongate until it is able to still have the connection. Because if you stretch it, you're already in the gap. You're already breaching some point. So in that way, it's important to understand that all the emotions, like for you, it's the horror for me, it's the emotional drama, romantic movies. I watch a romantic movie and my girlfriend is smiling and I'm like, I know what's going to happen. And I'm already, you know, like, because this is horror for me. This is trauma for me. Although I didn't have anything like that in my life, but something, you know, is triggering me. When I see people are crying or someone's going to die or someone is sick, I'm like <laughs> contracting. But getting to terms with myself, I'm learning how to process emotions emotions like energy in movement how yeah. to express emotions how not to be succumb under emotions or suppress them because i know if emotions come and i don't you know hold them somewhere down there i'm gonna explode how to know not to explode and all in that so before we continue and before we wrap up everything please aaron uh, show me a bit of an example if a person like me comes to you to your office or calls you and i have a serious hip con condition of the abuse of my cartilage when i sit i feel some pain i feel quite painful when it's in the sure. not right position angle uh please guide me through it i will lie down and let you do the work i'm gonna unmute myself okay perfect so um as you're doing that as you're about to lie down and setting up your camera I just want to just say like, you know, you and your hip issues, it's a little bit complicated. Um, and there's definitely probably a lot of stuff um, going on. But, you know, I'll give you one little example. And I just want to kind of give you an example of what happens when we activate um, a muscle. So what I would like you to do is to externally rotate your right leg. So yeah, without lifting your hips. So just externally rotate your right leg as much as you can. It doesn't, you know, there's no, just go to your own end range and then slide the leg to the right about 30 degrees. Okay, a little bit more. Okay, good. Is that, it? I think a little bit more than 30 degrees if you can. Very good, okay. Then bring your left hand to your left hip bone, your left pelvic bone. Just, I want you just to kind of cue that to try and keep that left pelvic bone on the floor and then slowly lift your right leg to about 35 degrees. And just notice how that feels. Okay, a little bit higher. So there's a little bit of wobbliness. Um, you can kind of just sense like, okay, and then lower it back down. So uh, you, you can probably just kind of sense what I want you to do and anybody who's following along with this, just kind of see how that feels. Now bend your knees um, 
bend your knees and bring your feet flat to the floor. We're gonna kind of set up for what sometimes is called a runner's stretch. So you're gonna bring your right ankle in front of your left knee, uh, your other right. Same position, but other leg. Yep, no, you can't do that. Well, let's try this then. Um, bring your right knee um, above your right hip. Can you do that? Okay, so bring your left hand towards your right knee. Now don't reach for the knee um, and just bring it sort of on the medial side, the medial, right there, that's perfect. Like right on the inside, right there. Yeah, now push the knee to the hand. Let your left shoulder drop down and can you push the knee towards the hand and hold it there for six seconds. So any times we do an exercise and uh, muscle activation, we always hold for six seconds. So then just relax everything down. Relax everything down. Bring the right foot to the floor. Take a breath. Big diaphragmatic breath. And then do that again. So bring the left hand. Try and keep the left shoulder on the floor more. And bring reach for the knee and then push the knee towards the hand. Now, how much effort should you make? Like you shouldn't be pushing so much that you're grinding your teeth and then relax down. That was six seconds. So you just want to just create like a bit of a contraction where we're shortening the psoas muscle and then getting it to contract. That contraction then starts to send a message to the brain. Yeah, do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six and lower down very good and then do it again and two try not to lift the right hip up too much yeah four five six and come on down and do it again and two so try to push the yeah the knee towards the hand three, four, and again, not so much that you're gonna create more pain and then back down, but you're just feeling that psoas muscle engage, okay? And do it one more time. And hold for two, three, four, five, six, and then come back down. Now straighten the legs out, very good. And then externally rotate that right leg. And then bring the right leg 30 degrees to the right. Very good. And then slowly lift that leg up and just notice if it feels a little stronger at this moment. Yeah. And then come on back down. So before you were trying to lift the leg, but what was happening was the psoas wasn't working. And so now we've got the psoas working, which is a major muscle in hip flexion that the leg now starts to kind of like float up. So that's the demonstration. That's just a little, a little, 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 little taste <laughs> of some of the things that we do. Thank you for the example demonstration. That was great. Yeah, that's one of my, I do that a lot with my students. There's a few things that I do. Um, and that's definitely one of them. And they can usually feel a, a dramatic difference just by doing something really small can have a big impact. And that's and what I should be pushing for. the left arm against the knee or just the knee pushing in the arm? Just the knee to the, the, the so hand. There's no resistance from the hand. No, the, the hand is just acting as a block. And because what's doing the movement is the psoas. The psoas is theoretically bringing the knee up and pushing the knee to the hand. So one, one of the steps I didn't do with you was getting your hand to feel your psoas shortening or contracting. And so what happens is like all the spindles in the psoas send a message to the brain, we're contracting, we're contracting, we're contracting. And the brain goes, oh, there's a muscle there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a feedback loop that yeah, we're yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, this is the working. realigning readjusting getting back together yeah. with what how body should function efficiently yeah. okay. now one thing i didn't do with you which i could have done um but i didn't want to because we got the muscle strong but i could have said to you 
hey, Jor, bring the right knee to your chest. Now hold, pull, pull the knee to your chest with your hands. If we had done that, and then had you retest again, you would have noticed that not only was it weaker, but it was weaker than you were before we even started the whole thing in the first place. Yeah. And that's what stretching does. It really debilitates um, the muscles function. Yeah. And the issue with my hip, for instance, sometimes when I before, like prior to understanding all this details and profoundness of living, you know, yes. so much needed profoundness. I sometimes couldn't step into the car on the driver's seat because I needed to lift maybe my, or, you yeah. know, to like kick my right leg into the, into the car. Uh, then the other thing is putting on socks or uh, cutting nails on my right foot. It's, I need to maybe also lift support it on the chair or on some lower thing that I can then reach and yeah. to cut my nails, it takes a lot of time and energy. So that's yeah. something that people with chronic injury go through. And this is now while I'm already working on myself on a deeper level. Imagine before yeah. when I had chronic pain all the time, I couldn't sleep. Sometimes I was nagging. I was a, a, a bastard to myself yeah. and others around me because this is influencing on your nervous system which of course then reacts and responds. And it's all the time in a stressful mode. And this is what people with chronic pain go through. Yeah. So this is unimaginable. And thankfully to Ayama and many other like IAQ and other uh, methods that help to alleviate and to relieve this pain and not only long term, and not only short term, but also long term. And that you yeah. understand where it comes from and how. Okay, Aaron. So now I can give you a demonstration of the AEQ method so that you can compare. It's a quite advanced exercise movement uh, after done doing some exercises on the floor where you feel more like a baby that you need to go back to baby steps. But uh, as the circumstances allow us, I would ask you to stand up so okay. that I see you from the side. And all the listeners can also try this maybe so that you have enough space uh, to lean forward in a way. Yeah. Okay. Just stand from the side, whichever side you prefer that I look at you. And we can go from here. Okay. So first uh, we will move the pelvis. All the movements in the AQ are done as slowly as possible. It's like a dimmer of the light, slowly okay. as possible. So first, maybe you can bend your knees just a bit, just a bit and you move your pelvis back as if you want to touch something with your behind, as if you want to touch the something in the behind. Yeah, yeah. Just, move, just move it back, your pelvis, like you want, and stay in that position. Okay, now your, your knees are bent, you have your uh, feet put on in the uh, hip width, and, and you are touching something as if you are touching something with your behind, so your pelvis is back. Now, you begin to relax each one of your vertebrae from the crucial, crucix, or how what's the last vertebrae? Up. So you begin to relax the muscles of your vertebrae from the behind lower back up. And slowly you will go with your head also down later afterwards. So relax the first vertebrae. You still hold that knees bent and you still hold your pelvis in that position and you slowly go down. As your vertebrae for vertebrae slower, slower, you relax. You also relax your hands that are dangling in the in the in the air. Relax your air. Relax your hands, arms. So slowly, yeah. You went like fifty kilometers an hour too fast, but okay. So no, oh, it's okay. <laughs> because the AEQ exercise is you relax your arms. Yes, yes, exactly. Slowly, without your uh, abdominal muscles going into contraction. This exercise is about relaxing your back, spine, and your behind gluteus and hamstrings. It's not pushing. The goal is not to touch with your hands, your feet, your, your uh, fingers on your feet. It's just to relax and expand, prolongate your back muscles. No force is there. So now slowly you will begin to lift up from the side from the back of your uh back from the lower back slowly you go vertebrae for vertebrae you go up and the last thing you lift up is your head your hands are dangling your head is down so slowly you go vertebrae centimeter for centimeter you activate 
the muscles of your back. Your pelvis is still back. Exactly. Exactly. Slowly you go back to the position because if you go fast, you also get dizzy maybe. Some people do. And then the last thing you do is you straighten your head. Great. Thank you for the demonstration. You can sit and I'll expand sort of a bit on this exercise. So it's forward leaning. It's, as I said, a very advanced exercise already. Many of the exercises I've done first on the, on the floor, lying down, because it's different gravity that you come in terms with, as with standing. But this is just to pull, put your pelvis as back as you can, and then slowly you relax. You're not pushing your body down with your abdominal muscles. You're not searching for something with your hands. There's no competition. You don't need to get somewhere. You're just relaxing all of your upper and your uh, feet and your legs are connecting you with reality or giving you stability. And you mm -hmm. also relax your hamstrings if you can and your gluteus maximus muscles mm -hmm. so that all of this is like a big arch of your body that you relax. Mm -hmm. And in that way, you begin to, to relax all of the muscles that are holding in, in space and holding in tension all of the mm. vertebrates and where actually hernia comes from. Uh, because mm. hernia is a situation, is a consequence where the muscles of the back were tense for so long for some reason of, you know, maintaining some illusional relationship with parents or someone that then they snap because they push out the disc out of the position. Oh, How did you feel the, the exercise? How did I feel? Um, it's for me, it was very similar to sort of yoga and mindfully working on trying to get the mind to muscle connection to encourage the muscles to uh, relax. Yes. Actually, I had a little adjustment in my neck as I was doing that. My neck went bloop. <laughs> yeah, because you consciously, very good. You are very present in this exercise. You don't need to be a yogi. Uh, or if you are, it's even better if you can relax and consciously send different signals. As yeah. prior also in yoga, you need to do some movement. You need to achieve some position in some way. Yeah. Of course, it's not like that, the yoga nature, but it's, it's the nature of ourselves. We need to compete in everything, especially yeah. men. So if you achieve this fullness of presence, then you can get this uh, like adjustment, not only in physical, but also in emotional. So it's a lot of this that's that's going on in, in, in these methods. Good. Let's uh, just almost wrap Thank it up. You. Let's touch some points regarding stability, mobility, function, efficiency. How do you see all these terms in your Ayama uh, approach? It, how do I see the term stability? Um, yeah, mobility, function, not flexibility. Not flexibility. <laughs> well, it's interesting because in yoga, um, I think like one of the first rules or guidelines or I don't know, whatever you want to say, axioms, so we have to get stable. And um, we can see that people who don't have stability, either physically or mentally, <laughs> there's there's not a lot of stability and there's chaos, um, pain, you know, either physically or mentally. So this kind of practice of a yama is, is all about like, let's get stable in the body. Before you were talking about pain and how many people are in pain. And I think like, you know, the kind of work that we're doing transcends so much because it's really about helping people get out of pain using very simple techniques um, that don't cost anything and and are free and um, you don't have to pay someone a lot of money or any money to do them you just need to commit to you know eight 15 minutes eight minutes 15 minutes 30 minutes a day and your whole life can change and i think like let's get people stable and feeling well in their body and once people start to feel better they free up so much energy and they can focus on higher things in their life like you know to go in and manifest their purpose and that's what i that's what i focus on in in getting people stable uh in their bodies good and and this is the point where 
people can get efficient and mobile yes. and, and stable, as you said, because all of the energy that before was spent and abused to maintain a certain tension is now released and yes. you have it available to use it. But of course, then there's another, we need to do another podcast on that, uh, on that <laughs> subject of what happens when you have more energy, but you're still angry. You <laughs> yes. might do some crazy things. So you need to go in terms and in alignment with growing and relaxing and also maturing because when you have more energy available, but you still have some, you know, suppressed emotions, you need to know how to deal with them and how to express them that they don't, you know, overflow or explode uh, in that way. Um, it's, yeah. it's one of the chapters in my book. It's actually the last chapter. Who are you? without your pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, but to get there, it's a lot of things to get there to be without things. pain because pain is not only physical, it's especially on many levels and consequently on this level, then it's transformed on this and then you're already in the vicious cycle in the downward spiral. As you mentioned, you can be so quickly on the upward spiral, but you need yeah. to just do the right steps. Yes. Uh, and the subconsciousness anyway, it's another big subject that we can touch on other <laughs> podcast yeah so um yeah just to wrap it up with some golden nuggets um maybe three exercises that you say or that yogis uh, need to avoid on all cost maybe some the joyous vitality approach that you want to that you can impact with well i i'm definitely stop stretching um, and I think that the number one yoga pose that yogis should avoid, which is their number one favorite pose, is child's pose. Um, you know, child's pose are the reverse of that, hugging the knees to the chest. So those are the two poses to avoid. Um, if you want to expand upon it, like avoid all hip openers. You know, yogis are like yoga people are so obsessed with opening their hips. Um, and that leads always to more instability which always leads to more pain um might feel good now but it will hurt later <laughs> a lot later <laughs> but the my favorite pose to teach people and i tell my teachers in training like this is something you must do every single yoga class and that's a pose called superman pose and where you lie on your stomach and you lift your legs and your chest off the floor very simple and do that every single day of your life, and that will help you to maintain a healthy spine. And a healthy spine is not only a happier person, but also a healthier life. Uh, How so, do you do the Superman pose? So if you lie on your stomach, okay, and then you lift your legs, keep your legs as straight as possible, and then keep, lift the chest off the floor. So, and your arms are just to the sides. And okay. so you're just lifting both up. But it's like one of the best poses because it activates the glutes, it activates the lower back muscles and a little bit in the upper chest. And so many of us, as you mentioned, are like, you know, hunched over our computers or devices. So by doing this, we can start to engage those back muscles to start working properly. One of the things that I'm starting to find out, I was just learning more about this um, just recently is that when we don't use muscles, the muscles start to atrophy, but fat cells start to penetrate the muscles and start to saturate the muscles. So they actually start to disintegrate and that's not a good thing. So doing these kind of backbends, this very simple backbend really starts to harness um, all of those muscles and starts to get them working. And we just don't use our back muscles enough. And when we do use them, they're used incorrectly. Like, you know, we fold forward and allow our muscles, our back muscles to support us instead of what should really be supporting us are our core muscles. So and that's my number one mus uh, um, posture. If people do that, their life will change, but you got to do it every day. <laughs> okay. Got you there. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I would I would add the understanding while you're doing whatever pose, the non-stretch pose, is to focus also not only what you are contracting, but also what are you prolonging? What are you 
making it longer. So the other yes. side, because if you relax more, then you don't need so much to work on the other side in contracting. It's the mm -hmm. same in life. If you want to get something, something, don't just focus on how to get it, but what to relax so that the thing comes to you. Sure. In that way. Uh, and for the last thing, please tell me everything that you count for as in stretching. What do you mean by no stretching? So how can people get in terms of, uh, am I stretching or am I not stretching? You mentioned some part in the beginning of our uh, chat now, but how more can you focus on that? Well, I would say anything that involves like um, a passive stretch. So passive stretch, like I used that example at the beginning, if you're lying on your back and, um, okay, let me show you, I can do a demonstration right here. So, but the de the, the thing I, I used at the beginning was if you're lying on your back and you bring your knees to your mm -hmm. chest and you hug your knees to your chest, child's pose is really passive because That's you're- That's stretching already or what? Yeah, that is stretching. Um, Don't also, do that. No see bodybuilders do this all the time they bring their arm so if you look at me and you can see like i bring my arm in that's my range of motion and then but now we... if I bring my hand now i'm going beyond a range of motion another example is like this one and then mm -hmm. they, they always... oh i did so many of these i'm so lucky that my shoulders are intact sort oh. of <laughs> Gracias I, got I got good off <laughs> only my uh, out of my four big joints the hips and my shoulders only one is heft up so <laughs> i'm good <laughs> many of people i know have all four damaged because yeah. of this what you mentioned okay great uh i love you so much that was a great great conversation all of what Thank you're you. doing and hopefully we'll we'll uh do more of these i would love that i would love to come back thank you so much Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Follow me on being the Genuine Athlete Instagram and Facebook page. Share, like and comment and be genuine all the way.